Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Creating Closer Connections, Elevating Librarian Expertise, and Support at the Point of Need, which is sponsored by Lean Library. Today's discussion is one in a series of webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All of the attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. Uh, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our presenters. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. Uh, you can also use the upvote feature to highlight any questions that you like. Also note that there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, last, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. Uh, and with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. We have Derek Malone, University Librarian and Associate Professor at the University of North Alabama. We have Talia Richards, a Marketing Director at SpringShare. And we have Mark Sinclair, Head of Development for North America at Lean Library. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will pass it over to Mark. Thank you so much, Sabrina, I appreciate it. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, again, my name is Mark Sinclair with Lean Library, and we appreciate you joining today's webinar, as Sabrina mentioned, uh, Creating Closer Connections, which we're gonna dive into, uh, you know, evaluating the library expertise and support at the point of need which is very important today. First, I'm going to take you through the agenda real quick. I'm going to start off with just a little background, and I'm going to go over some findings from our Librarian Futures report we did last year, which are pretty fascinating. And then I'll turn it over to Derek, where he will share some real world experiences at his university. And then Talia from SpringShare will jump in and discuss embedding libguides and libchat in the workflow. And then again, we open it to questions at that point. So first, let me uh, start off by discussing a little bit about our Librarian Futures report we did last year. And it was really centered around the library and the life of the user. And we had a great response of over 4,000 librarians and patrons across 1,500 institutions last year. And it uh, supplied us with some very valuable information. It's always helpful to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. So it was very, uh, very interesting to see the information we received. And I wanted to let you all know that you can download this report anytime you'd like. It's at librarianfutures.com. And feel free to download it and take a look. I think you'll, you'll find the information uh, very insightful. One of the things we learned from the survey, and it's something that we already knew, is basically that the, the modern academic workflow begins outside the library. And our own Lean Library data supports this in that we, we show that about 48% of patrons currently are beginning their research on Google Scholar. So it was interesting to see that we matched pretty well with the uh, survey. And then we went on and, and asked some other questions. Uh, and I'm just going to share a few with you today because I feel like these kind of are centered around our topic of, you know, point of need and helping the researcher in their workflow at that moment. And you'll notice here when we asked the question about the sources of information that were often used by patrons, and we broke it down by students and faculty. You'll see here at the top, the academic journals and books and assigned course readings, peers, news and media, faculty professors. But what was maybe a little concerning was as we get down a little further, librarians and Wikipedia were very similar in use at about 17 and 16%. And here's a quote from McCook that said, librarians who become skilled Wikipedians will maintain this 
the centrality of librarianship to knowledge management in the 21st century. But don't be alarmed uh, quite yet, because we went on to look at a few more items. And here is kind of talking about how our patron needs evolving. And again, a quote here from Cox says that as a result of the shift to remote working, patrons won't visit us as much as they used to. We'll need to bring our services to them. And our study showed that 91% of faculty and 63% of students consider literature search essential to their academic success. So that's encouraging. And 36% of both groups consider content evaluation important skill. So we have seen that patrons begin their literature search outside the library. And we have also seen that they rely heavily on non-library resources, whether it's Wikipedia, Google Scholar, etc. And as noted by Nichols and Davis, we need to consider how the library supports researchers' use of non-library information sources and find ways to incorporate support for those resources. But here's the encouraging news. When we ask the question, would patrons and librarians adopt a digital application of their library? we found some very high percentages where they said they definitely would or probably would. So 82% of librarians and 88% of patrons would want the library more deeply embedded in the workflow, even though that's kind of contrary to some notions where sometimes we think that they just want to be left alone. So this is very encouraging. We went on to ask if if they would be open to embedding the library chat and support in their workflow as well. And here the percentages were very high. So you can see that 96% of librarians and 90% of patrons consider this to be desirable. What we've done at Lean Library is we have a browser extension and we call it Lean Library Futures, where we are trying to accomplish what we found in that survey. Uh, with Lean Library Futures, it's going to enhance discoverability and make it easier to find content within the library, and we're going to streamline the access to it, which in turn is going to grow usage of the licensed content. And at the same time, it's important that we're going to increase the visibility and impact of the library as well. You know, in the, in the past, I feel like the library was really a destination the user would need to visit, you know, brick and mortar. They would be on campus and they would go to the library to do the research. But times have definitely changed. And the library is now needs to be more in the life of the user and kind of embedded in their workflows. And they need to have access, you know, 24-7, anywhere, anytime. And so with Lean Library, uh, futures browser extension. It's kind of like an app for your library right on your patron's desktop. And I'm going to show you here in a second some examples. We also wanted it to be a tool that would help all across the library. We didn't want it to just provide help with access to the library. We wanted to do more than that. And I'll show you some examples. But we, we try to help all these different areas of the library, whether it's accessing the library and the content support from the library, the discovery, the content, even some feedback, and then curation, maybe with some special collections. So with that, I'm going to take you through a few uh, slides here that will kind of show you what it looks like in action. And the first one here, it starts at Wikipedia, and they do a search on gold which leads them to the Wikipedia page about gold, but they might find a topic here that looks of interest. So with the Lean Library browser extension, they can right, they can right click and highlight it and actually go down and click on search library discovery. And at this point, it would take them to the library search results page. In our example, it goes to Google Scholar because we do not have our own discovery. So we're just giving you an example. But again, in this example, they would highlight any words that look of interest, they right click it, they go down to search library discovery where you can select up to five different search engines where they can then search that same content from the open web and bring back the resources from the library. 
I'll go to my next example here. And this is special collections on Wikipedia. And it's going to play through here a couple of times. So I'll try to do my best to explain what's taking place. Here is a special collection from the library that has been uh, pushed out to the user, even though they started on Wikipedia. So as we go back to the beginning here again, you'll see that they started here on Wikipedia, slavery. They went down and clicked digital collections from our Lean Library Futures menu. And then when they hover over their term, they can say read more. And then we push out your special collection to the user at their point of need, even though they started at Wikipedia on the open web. And again, you'll notice on the side in a minute, that's the Lean Library menu that comes out where they can select a variety of different uh, options. This next example, uh, Talia will like, this is regarding our Spring Share integration. And a couple of things are happening here. So as it plays through, they could go over and open up the menu and go down to library support where we would present them with the LibGuide at the point of need for the topic they're searching on the open web. At the very start of this, we had a, a push opportunity where they did their search and we pushed out the LibGuide to them without them requesting it. So you have a choice to either have it pushed out to the user or they can go to the menu and select library support where then we will present the LibGuide. <clears throat> We've seen usage at our uh, that one of our customers who put this in place saw a 600% increase in LibGuide usage with the Lean Library extension. And the last one I'll show you real quick, again, is around SpringShare and LibChat. If they start at Google Scholar and do a search, they can come out and say, I'd like library chat. And now we can bring LibChat out to the user at the point of need where they can ask their questions. Uh, we've had a lot of excitement around uh, this, this piece and uh, I think it will get a lot of use. So that's just a quick, kind of run through a few of the options that will help the researchers at their point of need, even though they're starting on the open web, maybe with Google, Google Scholar or Wikipedia, still receive the, the valuable content that the library has. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Derek where he will show you some real, real world experiences that he's had at the University of North Alabama. Thanks, Derek. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my name again is Derek Malone. I am the university librarian from the University of North Alabama, and I'm going to share uh, some of what we're doing with Lean Library for our users and their research. So uh, just to set the stage at the University of North Alabama, we are uh, growing, growing pretty rapidly. We're the fastest growing university in Alabama. And a lot of our growth is online and online in master's programs. There is uh, some traditional growth there too for in-person courses. We have a pretty robust undergraduate instruction program that is embedded within FYE and uh, both of our first year writing courses. And then we are uh, embedded throughout the uh, programs and other research intensive courses in their undergraduate careers and the same with graduate uh, programs as well. We, however, uh, felt a need to uh, go a little bit further with our instruction. We wanted to guide and assist throughout their research process beyond what we were doing in the classroom. That's both for undergraduate and graduate courses. And we really wanted to expand awareness around the resources that we provided through our library and uh, just let users be aware of what they have available throughout their research process. So uh, we were first exposed to Lean Library in uh, late 2020 and instantly fell in love with the program or the uh, browser extension and wanted to do uh, a lot with it to fill those needs and desired desires. And uh, here's some of what we've done so far. First, uh, we are between systems librarians right now, but our, our previous systems librarian set up Lean Library access to our electronic resources. So those could be illuminated to our users when they were out searching in Google or Google Scholar. We have integrated chat 
into Google Scholar for our users. Uh, we have heavily pushed this in instruction, and I think this is probably the most important thing that we've done with Lean Library so far. We have, uh, for example, we have an EDBA program that just started, and we have uh, tailored to their needs through Lean Library, and then when they're on campus, we make sure to push that they need to download this browser extension and use it for their research. They're also typically using Google Scholar by default over our discovery service. So uh, that's extra helpful to do that there. We've done a couple case studies and courses and we do push it in undergraduate and graduate courses because of those case studies. Uh, we had two education courses go through using L Lean Library, two did not. And then we surveyed about their experience after and it was overwhelming that those that went through the Lean Library process greatly uh, preferred that as a research vehicle and um, assistance. And then we have used a lot of what are called assist messages. And I'm going to show those here in a second. I'm going to go through a series of uh, GIFs and show some different things that we're doing, what it looks like. So this first GIF is uh, somebody landing with the Lean Library browser extension downloaded uh, and coordinated to the University of North Alabama on our local newspaper. And you probably experienced this with your local newspaper. Everything on this page is behind a paywall. So um, we, however, have access to this from a database called Access World News. Not only is it access, but it's same day access and it is image from the print. So they can look exactly like they're reading a newspaper, but there was a lack of awareness around this. So we created an assist message. We can't go directly to the resource, unfortunately, because of the way Access World News is set up, but we can push them through an assist message to that website so they can go and log in and read from there. Uh, we do the same thing with Flipster. We have some popular magazine subscriptions through Flipster. We use those in some of our writing and lit courses. And we want people to know when they go to uh, rollingstone.com, for example, that they can be redirected. And we have a redirect message at that website to Flipster and read from there. This is a uh, similar example with the Los Angeles Times. So Los Angeles Times for us is owned through our ProQuest subscription. We have a link there to go to the LA Times through that ProQuest subscription. Uh, this has been ex exceptionally helpful for that EDBA that I mentioned earlier, not so much for the LA Times, but for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the reason it's really good for the Wall Street Journal for them is because the Wall Street Journal and other places do this too, uh, changes titles uh, daily of different articles that have been written. And we want them to be able to go and at least see what's there so they can search and see the similarities and find uh, what the full text of what they're looking for, even if that title has changed. So we're pushing that through an assist message. Uh, these would be ones that aren't in Access World News, aren't in Flipster, but are available. Uh, through our subscriptions. This is just a still screenshot, but uh, I think it's really, really cool to see all the different things that are that can be done with Lean Library on one screen. Uh, when I took this screenshot, I didn't even realize how many things were going on here because of Lean Library, but uh, there are multiple and uh, there could be more than what we even have going on, but I'll, I'll highlight exactly what is because of Lean Library on this screenshot. First of all, it knows our subscription. So it knows that we have subscribed to these results. By the way, this is Google Scholar. So it knows that we have uh, subscribed to these resources. They have full text access. And that's the first one shown. It then has a link out to search uh, EBSCO Discovery Service. So that's because of our subscription too and our integration there. The third and the one that looks like a pop-up over there on the side, is an assist message that we have put on top of Google Scholar, encouraging people if they are um, frustrated or they're having a hard time getting the results they want to schedule a research consultation. So we're pushing one-on-one -on -one librarian contact on top of these other things that are being done in automation. And then behind that, that little button, uh, Mark pointed this out earlier, they can chat with someone immediately there if they click that 
and uh, they could get somebody to talk to throughout the research process immediately. So multiple things are going on there. Uh, we don't even have everything set up that we would like. Like I said, we'll be, be in between system librarians right now, unfortunately, but there is so much great stuff and content that can be put on a top of search uh, if um, configured correctly. So uh, I just wanted to give the kind of where we've been and now a moving forward outlook uh, from us at UNA. Uh, Lean Library has not only benefited, benefited us because of it as a program and users using it as a program, but it has kind of changed the way we think about things in general. We put on our homepage now a dedicated apps and downloads page. We hadn't gotten into the apps and downloads and browser extensions game until Lean Library. And we've seen others that can help our users too. And because of that, we created a page for users to go to and download all of these apps and browser extensions to make to basically go into a toolkit for them to enhance their discoverability. Uh, Flipster and um, other popular services like that are a great example of things that would also be on that page. So it just directs them to points of download to get these services. Uh, we would like to integrate more with research guides. That is definitely on the horizon for our lean library use and also more directing toward uh, resources for class usage. So we know that some classes are going to buy their Google search land at specific pages, and we want to redirect from those more toward guides and uh, assist messages. We, are, we do annual strategic goals within our library, and we are going to dedicate an entire goal next year to Lean Library. Uh, we really feel really good about where we are, and we wanna move forward with maybe the complete picture of what we can do there. Uh, I have to say, just uh, from a uh, library director point of view, our library and enthusiasm toward Lean Library has exploded over the last few years. Uh, I think with anything, you know, a new product, a new way of going about things, there's a little bit of skepticism. But as these benefits have been presenting themselves, the buy-in has just blossomed substantially. Uh, a couple examples of that. Our acquisitions librarian, because of that integration, is able to see things we own at different websites much, much easier. It's helped in weeding and, and assessment toward weeding. And it's really, really helped with requests from faculty members that are external to this unit. Because if we encourage Lean Library to be downloaded by them, when they find something on the web that we already own, they don't have to do a request anymore for us to buy it. They know it's already purchased and they're able to access them immediately. So that was really a game changer there. Uh, finally, the picture on the right of this slide is our login, our electronic resource login page for off-campus users and then a couple on-campus databases uses too. Anyway, uh, this had not been updated in 11 years. And it had a lot of old language on there and a lot of old internet protocols. But we changed it uh, just a couple of months ago and we added the custom download link for Lean Library to that page and, and have a little message about you can use this to see what's available in your workspace. And um, I think that moving forward, that's the approach that we're gonna to take to those users. We're gonna meet them right then and there and say, hey, this is gonna help you out. Give it a download and try it out. So that's our experience so far and where we're looking moving forward. And I'm gonna hand it over now to Talia to uh, share some Spring Share info with you. Hi, everybody. I'm just waiting for control. And you should have seen uh, launched on the screen um, <clears throat> a quick little poll. I'm just curious if you wouldn't mind sharing how many of you joining us today are ScreenShare users? Um, do you have LibGuides at your institution? Are you using LibAnswers with chat or any of our other tools? So as Mark mentioned and Derek um, hinted at, we are partnered with Lean Library for integration between the SpringShare tools and the Lean Library Futures uh, browser plugin or browser extension. 
basically we started at LibGuides and we then rolled out uh, LibChat, which you saw in one of the videos Mark shared. And we're looking at other ways to see how we might integrate. So a couple of things, I'm um, just curious to see what you're all using. And maybe if you wanna share in the Q&A, if you're interested in this, what other areas of integration you'd like to see between um, SpringShare and Lean Library. Oh, a lot of folks using LibGuides, really cool, 94%. Wow, hi everyone, hi my LibGuides users. And 59% using uh, LibAnswers with chat. Wow, tied with LibCal, so very cool. Um, thank you all for, for filling that out. All right, make sure that, there we go. So just recently, we celebrated our 15 year anniversary at SpringShare in April. So for those of you who have been with us since the beginning, thank you. But I wanted to share some really interesting stats um, that are really kind of directly attributed to all of you. So as of April 30th, um, 2022, so gosh, less than a month ago, there were at that time um, almost a half a million published libguides. So that was a snapshot in time of libguides that were currently published. This does not account for guides who, you know, over the last 15 years that were published and then unpublished or created and then deleted. So as of April 30th, at that time, almost a half a million guides were published, probably a lot more unpublished ones too. One of the things I thought was incredibly fascinating was <clears throat> since 2014, which is not that long ago, you all have answered 38 million Lib Answers questions, which includes 18 million chats. So in eight years, you all have answered 18 million chats and 19 million Lib Answers tickets. So when you're just looking at these two quick stats right there on the, on the PowerPoint. Um, it's quite clear how much amazing stuff you all are doing. Um, you're spending incredible amounts of staff time developing these guides. Um, I know because I was a librarian and I used to develop guides. So I know exactly what you all um, go through building guides for your patrons, for your students, for your faculty. And, and I also know the pain of trying to drive traffic to those resources, the guides that you're building, the chat services that you're staffing and releasing and offering and how to get people to use the service, right? So it's advertising, it's marketing, it's getting the word out, which of course increases their usage. But what it also does, it, it increases the return on your investment because that is an investment in addition to the subscription of the tool. It is also the staff time and investment of creating those resources and staffing that chat. So you want to increase your return on your investment for every eyeball that lands on your LibGuide that uh, reduces the cost of, of, of having created it, right? So uh, instead of something having cost, you know, X dollars, it costs a little bit less. So in addition to wanting to increase usage, you also want to increase the return on your investment. And one of the things when I was an academic librarian um, at Johnson Wales University in Providence, Rhode Island, one of the things that um, would absolutely like make me go insane was when I was doing an instruction session or I was talking to somebody at the reference desk and they were a senior or a graduating, um, you know, graduate student is they would say to me, you know, I wish I knew you had that, that guide or I wish I knew that you had had chat service. I had no idea. And it was, it was those phrases that would, that would go, oh gosh, how, am I, how can I get the word out better? How can I increase traffic and, and access to these resources? And I'm sure all of you have heard those terms and those phrases <laughs> multiple times as well. Now, fast forward a little bit <clears throat> to, to COVID and our current COVID, are we post, who knows? error is that um, statistics for online learning is not going anywhere, okay? Um, we saw a huge dramatic increase in online learning in uh, 2020 and 2021. In fact, this is um, from the NCES survey that they did for fall 2020, which is 73% uh, of post-secondary students were enrolled in any type of distance education course. 
So you're talking about students who may never, ever, ever come to class, ever, may never come to class, may never come to campus, maybe on the other side of the country. And how do you reach those users? And Derek was saying they're, they're um, one of the fastest growing institutions in all of Alabama, mostly because of their online learning programs. There you go. Of the 14.1 million post-secondary students enrolled in fall, 39% of them were enrolled for some, but not all of their classes. And then this is the stat, 61% were enrolled exclusively in distance education courses. So when you're thinking about how to reach students and how to reach patrons in their workflow, because as Mark showed, 50% of them are starting at Google Scholar. That's where they're starting. They're not starting at the library website. They're not starting at your LibGuides homepage, right? So they're starting in the workflow they're accustomed to. 61% of them are gonna be completely distanced. They're never gonna to come to campus. How do you reach that huge percentage of online learners in their native workflow when that's probably your largest growing sect on campus, right? Now, another last stat is that 87% of undergraduate students experienced enrollment disruption. So even if you're like, well, on my campus only, you know, we don't have 61% of online learners, we have much less, you probably experienced or your students experienced some type of enrollment disruption in the last two years. And it probably will continue for the foreseeable future. COVID outbreaks, campus has to shut down, student test positive, needs to be sent home, can't be on campus, but still needs to participate in their classroom and online learning. So <clears throat> this is not going anywhere with 84% experiencing some or all in-person classes moved to online. So how at Spring Show, what are we doing to kind of address this? How are we wanting to ensure that your patrons are getting serviced at point of need? Well, first, of course, we, we, we did our partnership with Lean Library in order to integrate your LibGuides into the Lean Library's Futures plugin. So it's right in the native workflow. In addition to that, we also recently got certified through the IMS Global certification for our LTI integration, which allows you to natively integrate your SpringShare tools and LibGuides into courseware. So that's Blackboard, um, Canvas, um, Desire to Learn, all of those. So we are now um, certified through the IMS Global with our courseware integration. Uh, another thing that we're going to be adding, um, and you all might be excited about this, this is a little sneak peek, is that we are adding chatbot AI to our LibAnswers and LibChat, which might make it um, even cooler integration with the Lean Library, because when they go ahead and click to chat, maybe you already have an FAQ that outlines what they need, and you don't necessarily need to launch a live chat with a librarian right at that moment. So when they start chatting, maybe it suggests some FAQs that you've already built, and if they still need more assistance, it can route them to the live chat feature. And of course, our tight integration with Lean Library. Now, all of this is a little bit post-COVID, but pre-COVID, <clears throat> the research has shown us time and again, and it was in the Lean Library Futures Report that uh, Mark shared with 4,000 responses, which is a huge sample size, but research, um, LibGuide-specific research has shown time and time and time again that the most effective guides are contextual and point of need. So it's not enough to deliver um, content that is just contextual, but also delivering it at the point of need. They don't want broad A to Z lists that they have to find which database is right for them. They want the best databases for that class or that assignment. Um, and this is why we also have seen that course and even assignment specific LibGuides do much better than broad research guides, which is something I think Derek mentioned is they wanna more tightly integrate those types of guides into the learning library workflows as well. Um, we have seen statistically Google Analytics has shown that session duration um, of which is the amount of time somebody stays on a website is much, much higher and longer for course guides than for broad subject guides. Um, so 
you're going to get more bang for your buck. Once again, return on your investment. If, some, if a librarian is building that content and spending time building a guide, make sure they're delivering the guide that's going to have the most effective outcomes. So all in all, what happens when you combine, you know, this high percentage of online learners, more than we've ever seen, ever, and their need to have more targeted point of need and contextual research. Well, you're going to have huge statistics. <laughs> so right over here, um, this was in the Lean Library's future report at the time the report was live, and I'm sure the numbers are even higher. The report went out, came out last year, was um, roughly 32,000 times a week LibGuide are embedded, um, I'm, I'm sorry, roughly 32,000 LibGuides are embedded in LMSs, and those guides are accessed roughly 47,000 times every week. So contextual point of need works. Um, and as Mark highlighted, um, one of the Lean Library and LibGuides users, um, when they launched the integration between um, Lean Library and LibGuides, they saw a 600% increase in usage of those guides. So guides that they had already made and already built and had been around for years suddenly saw a 600% increase in usage on that. All right, so, um, in case it wasn't clear, <laughs> we are re really excited for our, our partnership with Lean Libraries, our integration between um, our tools, your tools that you subscribe to and spend time in and, and, and blood, sweat and tears building all of these resources and offering services and integrating it more tightly into the patron workflows, which is in their browser and bringing the library to them in their browser. Imagine being able to launch a chat on any website you are on. I could be on Facebook and being like, how do I change my privacy settings on Facebook? I'm a, I'm a 18 year old student and I wanna make sure that I know how to do this right. Oh, there's the library chat. Let me go ahead and ask them. So being able to launch library services on any website through that, that plugin is, is just really incredible. So increasing visibility, impact, and growing usage. All right. I think we are opening it up for questions. All of our contact information is at the bottom of that, or maybe it's on the, the side here. I don't know where the, <laughs> where the camera is, but all of our contact information is here. You're welcome to email all of us um, for, you know, if you have any questions. And I'm sure uh, Sabrina and the Choice team will be sharing the slides as well. Great. Thanks so much, Talia. And thanks so much, Mark and Derek, for your presentations. A lot of great information. Uh, looks like we have a few questions already in the Q&A, uh, but if you haven't yet, I'd encourage everyone to submit your questions. I know Mark has answered a good amount as well, um, so we might go back and read those out just so we have them on the recording as well. Um, but for now, let's jump right in. Uh, Let's see, we have a question here that asks, how is the integration between Lean Library and LibGuides in terms of usage statistics? Do you have everything in one place? So on the SpringShare side, you will still, you will see the usage of your LibGuides inside of your LibGuides statistics area. So it will just show that you've had an increase in views um, and you'll be able to view all of the statistics there. Mark, I, I don't know if you all offer um, statistics on like the launching. I'm, I'm sure if you wanna jump in on that. Yeah, yeah, th thanks Talia. Yeah, we offer some statistics that show how the tool is being used. Since we're very uh, concerned about privacy and security, of our libraries and the, their patrons, we don't have any personal information. So we do have stats, but it's more from a general perspective that shows it's been downloaded and shows how many times they've gone to different places. Like did they see an assist message or they led to the full text within the library's collection and items like that. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Another question here 
from Cameron who asks, does the librarian have access to a referring link when helping folks who come in through the chat via Lean Library Extension? So this is a lib chat lib answers question and the answer to that is yes. So you will see the, the referring URL. So, uh, so what website are they on? that kind of caused them to want to launch this chat, which is great because like if they're on Google Scholar, you'll know. And if they're on um, like non-library owned web pages, you'll know that they started their chat from these non-library owned web pages and you can use that to direct them to the library owned and subscription resources and get them off those other sites as well. Got it. Okay. Uh, another question here uh, from Sam who asks, my colleagues and I wonder how much of our content is seen by Google Scholar because it already links to some when you link your library within your Google Scholar account. Do you have any idea of the percentage difference between what Google Scholar sees of a library's collection when a library is linked versus when we use the Lean Library extension to fully link our resources? I'm not sure if I fully understand. Derek, do you have any insight as to this since you're a user? I don't know the difference answer. Um, so I, I, I can't answer that, but there was a similar question that came up earlier about uh, is how different is it uh, in compared to setting up that access through your account on Google Scholar? Uh, I can't speak to the difference, but I can say this for us and our users and what we've observed in the, the case studies we've done, it's a lot easier for them. And it's a lot easier for us to push them downloading an extension as opposed to going through all those processes of setup. But I don't know the difference in the amount of content that you see one versus the other. I think that's good, Derek. And I think the thing that Brent Lean Library brings outside of just what Google Scholar would with the links you would set up is that Lean Library does so much more than just provide them uh, links to your content. If we don't find it within your collection, we also present them with open access. If we don't find it open ac access, we can present a link to your interlibrary loan. And then there's the ability to push out your discovery results to the user and the libguides and everything else. So again, I, I, it, it's kind of hard to answer that question directly, but Lean Library does so much more than what just those links do that are set up with Google Scholar to your library, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, great. Um, let's see, we have another question here. Uh, are you planning on are you planning some collaboration with Open Athens or maybe yes. any other types of collaborations coming up? No, Floor, that, that's a great question. We actually partnered with Open Athens uh, years ago, and so we uh, we currently have a, a I don't know if you really call it a partnership, but we we have an agreement with Open Athens. We work very well with Open Athens. Most of our libraries have either Easy Proxy, Open Athens, or uh, Shibboleth, and we work with all. But we have a great relationship with Open Athens. We've actually done a uh, webinar with them. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. It's a question from Robert who asks, is there any efforts by the library worlds with working with Google Scholar to make Google Scholar more of a library resource using RDA or something of this sort, like an open source Google Scholar? I don't know how, how much you all can speak to that, but. Um. Well, Derek is our librarian and Talia, you are librarian. So I'll <laughs> leave that to you both. I don't have an answer to that question. I've stared at it and thought about it, but I don't have an answer to that question, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was looking at that question as well. And <clears throat> I mean, there's always there's always a desire and a goal to create kind of an open source community of sharing content, but you're talking about going up against um, quite a large company that has, you know, billions and 
billions of dollars <laughs> and trying to create um, a global library volunteer, volunteered uh, open access version of a billion dollar resource is a mountain that would be very difficult to climb. Um, and, and, then, and then conversely, their algorithm is proprietary and how you would even create a really good algorithm that would even be able to compete. There's a lot of components to that and I'm not being a naysayer, but I'm just saying, uh, I think it's a, it's, it's a, it is a large um, walnut to try and crack <laughs> from, from lots of different angles. Got it. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have a question here from Julie who asks, are you familiar with LibKey and how does Lean Library compare? I'll answer that one. So uh, we are familiar with LibKey. We are a um, third iron subscriber also. So we have both the LibKey extension and the Lean Library extension. Uh, I think this is probably going to be the number one question somebody would have if they were exploring Lean Library, because on the surface, because of what they are, I think they can appear similar, but they are very different products in our opinion. Uh, LibKey is bound to browsing, as far as I know. I, I think that LibKey is bound to browsing and that a resource has to be there uh, for it to be discoverable. With that said, I think LibKey's all awesome. I love the, it's a great browser extension, uh, super useful for our user. For us, they're both on that apps and downloads page. Like I had said that we created an apps and downloads page to kind of equip our user with a toolkit to best serve them. LibKey is another thing that is on that page and it will stay on that page the same as Lean Library because in conjunction, they're awesome together. Lean Library though, for us, much, many more things are discoverable because they're not bound to a single platform. Like I said about the, uh, the faculty members finding resources outside of our page and then maybe requesting they be purchased when we own them, that pops up because of Lean Library. The assist messages are there because of Lean Library. Um, pointing to other things that we own but we can't generate custom links are there because of lean library so for us like on the google scholar screenshot there were four different things going on there at least for because of lean library for us libkey would have one but it's a very valuable one so i think uh, i guess to summarize that they work really really well together but they are two pretty separate entities Got it. I didn't know if you wanted to comment, Mark. It looked like. No, I was just gonna say Derek. Derek nails it pretty much. Uh, the majority of my customers have uh, LiveKey as well, because they really complement each other. But they do do different things. I, I think they overlap a little bit. But as Derek pointed out, there there's quite a bit of difference. So a lot of my, like I said, the majority of my customers do have both. Mm. Got it. Okay. Uh, another question here from Claire, who asks, how many community colleges uh, adopted Lean Library? If so, could you name a few so we can take a look? Yeah, certainly, Claire. Uh, we don't have a, a ton of community colleges, but we do have a few. And uh, a few of them, I believe, are in California. We have Ventura College. And uh, I always pause here because I don't want to say it wrong. I think it's Chabot, C-H-A-B-O-T, Community College. Uh, again, I apologize to anybody if I didn't say that correctly, but th those are a couple. Great. Okay, um, let's see. I thought we could go back, because I know, Mark, you answered a bunch, uh, so maybe some popular ones that you already tackled, um, so we can get them on the recording. And in the meantime, if anyone has any other questions, feel f please feel free to send them in. Um, Nancy asked about usability studies, um, learning about how students feel about the automatic notifications. I don't know if you want to speak to that more, anything you've looked at from that. 
Oh, I think you're muted. And that's one that I think I answered. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And that was from Angela? Uh, Nancy. Nancy. There we go. Yep. Have you ever, have you done any usability studies to learn how students feel about the automatic notifications? Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's a great question. And we, we've heard a lot about this and Derek might have some insight too, but some of the things we've done since we released the extension back in about 2017 is that we've created an advanced setting so that each user has a choice and they can make some settings. And then when the pop-up happens, if it's one they see often and they know it's going to pop up, they can go over and actually check a box and say, I no longer want to see this anymore. And so then it will not show up again in the future. So we really have uh, improved our advanced settings greatly. And that really does help, seem to help in this area quite a bit. Great. There, there's some also uh, on the um, staff side of things, you can customize settings like that too, to show on, you know, a parent page only, for example, that's an option there. Um, we haven't specifically looked at this with students, but we did pull a couple of assist messages uh, that we had. Amazon was an example. We had an assist message on Amazon and it was applying over all Amazon. And it was the only complaint was from librarians about it because every time they would go, it would show there. So we pulled that assist message. Students, we haven't had a complaint, but um, we're aware of, you know, you gotta be strategic in how you, how you add those. Mm. Yeah, it looks like there's a follow on follow up to the assist messages. Um, Denise asks, can you explain a little more about how the assist messages work? Maybe you speak to that. So, uh, and I'll, I'll talk about how we use them and yeah. then Mark, if you want to jump in. Um, for us, it's like a, it's like a cu custom pop up that you can use on that website to either let your user know that something exists, access exists to that resource. Uh, another way, that's kind of the local newspaper example. Or if you want to help them and you know, like if you are doing, uh, if you have a class that you know either by the instructor or just by common usage is going to go to a web page like let's say that they were going to use population population statistics and we were it was highly likely they went to the census or something like that we could then lay on top of that a hey have you uh considered these resources too just to help you along how about going to this lib guide and and looking at the videos that we've set up to help your search so for us it's just a message either to highlight a resource we have or to help in the research process. Yeah, yeah, I think that's good, Derek. The only thing I would add is that the assist messages really are for you to set up any message you wanna get out on any do domain and any URL that you'd like. Just to let you know, we've had libraries that have set up an assist message when they're trialing a new product so that anybody lands on that new product they could send up a system that says, hey, we're looking into this. Would you please provide some feedback? And they put a, they embed a link in the pop-up to give feedback to the library. We've had libraries use it because maybe a resource is down. They can target that site. And if anybody lands on it, they'll let them know the resource is down. But hey, please click here to find other databases that could help you today. We've even had a library that once used it for an open house they were going to have. Hey, come by next week. Free cookies on Tuesday. So really, the assist message can be used to send any information you'd like on campus or off campus. So it's not just an off campus thing with the assist. I, I wanted to jump in really quickly if I could, because something Derek said that really stuck with me was when you know a class is working on a specific assignment and I'm having like flashbacks to my librarian days when I knew that the advertising and marketing classes were going to be using the advertising red books <laughs> website like i knew it and they would come in always at the same week you know week six of the semester for their research project and you know if we had 
had, if Lean Library had existed back then, it would have been great to have put up some kind of assist message or connected it to a LibGuide so that when they are going to this website that they are being told to go to by their professor that is in the assignment, that we give them all of the resources, the contextual point of need help on that web page. Click watch this video, learn how to use the site, um, check out this LibGuide that explains how to use the site and kind of catch them at when they're doing the assignment, which might be three o'clock in the morning and you're not open, right? So being able to push that information to them. I was just thinking of that, Derek, when you were talking specifically about knowing the web pages that they have to do for their assignments and targeting them. It's great. Yeah, that is great. Um, Okay, we have another question here from Sam who asks, how does Lean Library play with assistive tech like screen readers, and maybe any other accessibility functions? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question, Sam. And we are always working towards accessibility. And uh, we do have a VPAT for our product. And I can't tell you exactly how we're working with screen readers at the moment or give you some details, but I know we are. Uh, our Lean Library Access product is fully compliant and we're always looking to improve. So I, I can supply some more information if you need. And Derek, I don't know if you've had any any experience with the screen reader in Lean Library. Oh, we haven't. I, okay. I wish I could answer that. Got it. Okay. Um, let's see, another question from Julie. This could be a quick quick yes or no. Um, could you put assist messages on sites like Chegg or Course Hero to direct back to the library? You could, and I think I'll go a step further than that. I, it's also going to look for that ISBN. That that was kind of our Amazon thing. Like if there, you know, multiple things were in, the, that's why we had that. We The whole reason that message was in Amazon was for our textbook affordability initiative. But um, you could even isolate by book if you wanted to point that back and say, hey, we have a really good course reserves program, check this out. But it's also going to look uh, just self-integrate. Well, once you set up the e-resources integration, it's gonna look for that ISBN number. Okay, got it. Um, let's see, just have a few more minutes here. Um, Okay, looks like we have another question here from Anne, who asks, how do the assist messages track users in order to show the correct library links to them? IP address? Uh, no, the assist, you would be, if our user was using Lean Library, they would, they would set it up to be a University of North Alabama user. So they would get our assist messages only. It wouldn't be uh, IP address bound. It's bound by what you uh, set up as your profile for Lean Library. That, that's perfect, Derek. And just so everyone knows, when the user first downloads the extension, it asks them to select their institution they're affiliated with. So they have to select their institution. And once they've done that, then it knows to only look for stuff from that library and that institution. Got it. And somebody okay. asked Sabrina a little bit ago how we price mm. our tool. And I did let them know just so it's on the recording that we do price by FTE. Okay, great. Yes, thank you for that. Okay, yeah, it looks like we're just at the end here. Um, so I'll say thanks so much to Mark, Derek and Talia for taking the time to present for us today. And thanks to our attendees for your questions and comments. This was a really informative and great discussion. Um, I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Um, also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we'd really appreciate it. Um, your responses help improve our presentations. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the session, and we hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. Bye, everyone. See ya.